I think we've said enough about the connected problems around collectivism, globalism, and authoritarianism for now. So as we now head into the home straight of this series, or at least as we begin moving in that direction, let's start now considering some of the other features of the postmodern age that we can expect to see emerging in the years ahead if the trench theory holds true. Starting with the idea that the postmodern age will become increasingly more feminine. You see, because the soft virtues are embodied by women and because the hard virtues are embodied by men, femininity is increasingly exalted in our time, whereas masculinity is increasingly denigrated and hated and reviled in our time. Now, I don't think this development is really in any doubt. Feminism has experienced a gradual growth in support since the love revolution of the 1960s. And although in this generation you will never, or at least rarely hear the term toxic femininity, toxic masculinity, on the other hand, is an idea which is very much in vogue. You'll hear that phrase all the time in our age. The term came to prominence in the 1980s, but it's seen a surge of usage from the 2010s, and it's now thrown around in a rather blasé fashion, often when men, are simply behaving like normal, well-adjusted masculine men. Now let's be clear though about what this word toxic actually means. Some synonyms for toxic are deadly, harmful, lethal, noxious, pernicious, virulent, pestilential, poisonous, and venomous. Imagine being told that an essential part of your nature is like a poison, is like a virus, it's pestilential, it's harmful. Traditional expressions of masculinity are now not only seen as something outdated, but as something dangerous, something threatening, something akin to a virus, something evil. It's easy to see why the leftist generation feels that way, why it feels threatened by masculinity. Postmodernists, after all, want feelings to triumph over facts, and yet men tend to work in the opposite direction. They tend not to budge on facts, even if it does hurt feelings. While postmodernists hold love as their highest value, men tend to want to make sure that truth and justice have their place. While postmodernists want harmonious cooperation at all times, men are naturally competitive beings. While postmodernists want equality above all things, competitive men naturally produce inequality. While postmodernists are comfortable with a dependence on the state, men have this natural masculine urge to want to strike out on their own in life, to forge an independent path and take responsibility on their own shoulders. While postmodernists want to be led, men naturally have this masculine urge to want to lead. So masculinity just doesn't fit the mold for this joff generation. So the leftist thinks to themselves, how can we build our peaceful collectivist utopia centered around the soft virtues when there's such things as men in it? They're getting in the way with all of their natural masculine urges. They embody everything that this generation hates and has been trying to escape since 1967. So to counter this problem then, for many decades now, there's been a concerted postmodern attempt to change the idea of what a man is. In short, there's been an attempt to demasculinize men. Men are being told that they must become more like women in the postmodern age. From at least the 1990s, experts in the media have been talking about the need to put men in touch with their feminine side. Now you never hear this in the opposite direction. You never hear women being told that they have to get in touch with their masculine side. And this means that men were to be more emotional and relational like women. Instead of being stoic and brave and courageous and leading from the front, they were to cry more, be softer, and to talk about their feelings more. The term metrosexual was coined around this time. A metrosexual man was a new kind of man who unashamedly enjoyed pursuits and activities more traditionally associated with women. Fashion, shopping, skincare, beauty products, shoes, bags, makeup, and moisturizer. Their body hair was generally shaved as well, conforming to a more feminine standard of beauty. Now, as we've moved into the 2020s, this has developed still further, and men are now frequently congratulated and celebrated for wearing female clothing. In recent years, celebrities like Harry Styles, Billy Porter, Jaden Smith, Keenan Lonsdale, Mark Jacobs, Brandon Wilson, Jonathan Van Ness, Jared Leto, Post Malone, Ezra Miller, and Dominic Calvert-Lewin have all challenged so-called toxic masculinity by wearing skirts and dresses in public. 
They've been lauded in the media, they've been celebrated for their so-called progressive attitudes, and anyone who expressed misgivings about all of this nonsense on social media was predictably admonished for manifesting toxic masculinity. One wrote on Twitter, all the people saying Calvert Lewin shouldn't wear that schoolgirl uniform are prime examples of toxic masculinity. We wonder why men's mental health is so bad, and you look at these comments. Now, although celebrities are renowned for such nonsense, attention-seeking behavior, and their fashion choices alone cannot be considered conclusive evidence of a deeper societal desire to feminize men. In 2016, Joe Haywood, the head teacher of Heathfield Boarding School, made the headlines for encouraging the young boys in her school to start wearing dresses. She said, if a little boy wants to explore wearing a princess dress, that is to be encouraged. Have girly makeup, but let boys have it too. In 2019, 10 Australian schools began encouraging boys as young as eight to start doing the same, to start wearing dresses and skirts. The same year, a school in Manchester updated their policy to allow boys to wear skirts. And in 2021, Castleview Primary School in Scotland requested that boys wear skirts to show solidarity with an initiative called Clothes Have No Gender. So within the context of the postmodern age as we now understand it, and because we now understand the trench theory as we now do, these things clearly combine to represent a war on masculinity itself. It's a war on boys and it's a war on men. The war starts from the moment boys enter school. Back in 2000, Christina Hoff Sommers from the American Enterprise Institute wrote a book called The War on Boys, How Misguided Feminism is Harming Our Young Men, in which she talked about how our civilization's restructuring around feminine ideals was harming the next generation. Being a normal boy is a serious liability in today's classroom. Boys tend to be disorganized and restless. Some have even been known to be noisy and hard to manage sound like any boy you know, but increasingly our schools have little patience for what only a couple of decades ago would have been described as boyishness. As psychologist Michael Thompson has aptly observed, girls' behavior is the gold standard in schools. Boys are treated like defective girls. Now, as a result, these defective girls are not faring well academically. Compared with girls, boys earn lower grades, they win fewer honors, they're far less likely to go to college. Boys are languishing academically while girls are prospering. In an ever more knowledge-based economy, this is not a recipe for a successful society. A major 2015 US report of 5,000 subjects supported her observations here. The report concluded that school environments were being tuned to fit feminine typed personalities. And while that was making it easier for girls to achieve better grades, boys were being left behind. Indeed, boys were beginning to underperform quite significantly compared to girls, failing to attain decent levels of proficiency in reading, being less likely to go to university, and being more likely to drop out altogether. In the United States then, girls now make up 60% of college enrollments, while men only 40%. College enrollment as a whole has dropped by 1.5 million in the past five years, but males make up 71% of that drop. As of 2018, 76% of educators in the American system were also women, which suggests that there's a lack of male perspective in schools right now, and this means that boys and the boy psyche are often being misunderstood. For example, as Hoff Sommers points out, female teachers will often report today that boys are not as interested in reading as girls, but then a closer inspection reveals that they're not as interested in reading because they're being given books that appeal to girls and the girlish psyche. Girls like fiction, but boys like non-fiction. As we know, girls are interested in people, but boys are more interested in things. If you give boys books that they enjoy, they will read just as voraciously. Many boys are being given into trouble and suspended for normal boyish things because female teachers don't understand that boyish psyche. Hoff Sommers describes a boy in California called Justin who was suspended for drawing a picture of pirates fighting. The female teacher thought this was evidence of a disturbed mind when, in fact, pirate battles are a normal, regular thing 
for boys to be interested in. Another Maryland boy called Josh was sent home from school for nibbling his Pop-Tart into the shape of a gun. The feminization problem extends into sports days and recess as well. Competitive games that boys enjoy are now being banned from the postmodern playground because teachers think it will be too harmful to self-esteem and they're just too competitive. They want everyone to get along rather than to compete. In schools throughout the country, games like dodgeball, Red Rover, even tag have all but disappeared. Too damaging to self-esteem or too violent being the usual excuse. One popular classroom guide suggests tug of war be replaced with tug of peace. As Michael Thompson said, the school environment today idealizes girlish behavior as the gold standard and treats boys merely as defective girls who have to be molded into a more female form. From a very early age, boys are being taught that their natural enthusiasms and even their very nature is unwanted, problematic, harmful, dangerous, pestilential and toxic. So is it any wonder that under those conditions, boys are beginning to fall behind? As our schools become more feeling-centered, more competition-free, more sedentary, they move further away from the needs of boys. We need to reverse the boy-averse trends. Male underachievement is everyone's concern. These are our sons. These are the young men with whom our daughters will build a future. If boys are in trouble, so are we all. She's right. Our society's hatred of masculinity will cause untold problems for us in the years ahead if we don't reverse it. I can't get into all the outworkings here in this particular episode, but for example, it's the masculine urge for competition, that urge that teachers are trying to knock out of boys in the playground, it's that desire for competition that drives society's innovation and economic growth. Competition is not a bad thing. Competition drives skill and excellence and humility and discipline and progress. All of those things that we looked at earlier on in this series. It's the masculine interest in things rather than people that means they invent things like cars, planes, skyscrapers and the internet. It's men's harnessed aggression that you'll turn to the next time your house is being burgled. And it's to men's strength that you'll turn to the next time there's a war to be fought or a criminal to be apprehended. That male energy that you've got no time for in the classroom, that will be the energy that builds roads and sewage systems and society's infrastructure. It will be men who will keep that infrastructure going when it breaks down. Men who will fix your toilet or your car or your computer. It will be men's stoic and less emotional nature that you'll really value in pressurized situations in the future when everyone else is losing their minds but he remains calm. When you need a dependable leader of homes, wives and families, it will be his decisive nature that you'll turn to and really value when the way forward seems unclear. That's when you'll really value his stoicism. His natural desire to take dangerous risks, the ones that you can't abide right now, it'll be that nature that also propels him to take heroic risks in the future. Being willing to run into burning buildings buildings when everyone else is running in the opposite direction. Masculinity when properly harnessed and allied with moral goodness is not something to be feared or stamped out, but instead it is something fundamental to a healthy and prosperous society. Masculinity at its best means leaders, protectors, providers, innovators, warriors and self-sacrificial heroes. Strong families and communities literally depend on these things. And to be honest, we could do not with less of masculinity, but we could do with a bit more of them in our particular time, in a culture that's becoming overwhelmed right now by the worst excesses of the soft virtues. We need men and we need masculinity now, perhaps more than ever.